Hello, and welcome to Staying Strong for Marriages. Thanks for stopping by. Hey, my friends, what's up? Welcome back to Staying Strong for Marriages. I heard a fairly decent joke. I'm going to let you know about it. It says that, you know, Caesar is now a salad dressing, but Jesus, he's still the king. So I like that one. Start off a little more lighthearted note. We've been doing some really tough videos on theology, technical ones. What's pornea? What does it mean? And we've sometimes looked at some hard stuff that says, hey, don't get involved in sin. Don't get yourself deeply stuck in a lifestyle of sin, whether that's um, divorce, because God says, you know what I have brought together? Don't take it apart. And we often see the same thing coming from the apostles in 1 Corinthians 7. So sometimes we've like talked about some of the serious consequences and that may not really capture the heart or help prodigals all that much. What I'll say is what I mean by prodigals is people who have left their families and are kind of sorting out what they want to do and should they go home or shouldn't they. I would say that most of my uh, ideas in creating content is to help people who are standing, who are waiting, who are praying to don't give up and to realize the good thing that they're doing, right? The loving thing that they're doing. I don't do a lot of content for people who have exited the marriage and are out doing whatever and how to help them come home. So I also heard a great quote from Mark Meldrum who said, you can't beat an emotional argument with a logical argument. Ah, which is why I want to look at this video because a lot of the theology stuff we've been looking at has been very logical or it's come from like a cognitive, it's an irrational argument, right? But sometimes those arguments, hey, God said to do this, just falls on deaf ears. People, this is not what they're doing. Um, that's not what they're going through. They're dealing with maybe stuff. We're going to look at this about a father wound. So let's jump into it. Like I said, Marriage Revealed Ministries, it's a, another group or group of people. It's a blog. You can check it out. It's kind of maybe more for women, in my opinion, but you know, the gold and the purple and the, I know these are royal colors, uh, but it's it's run by a woman, so that's kind of more of the content you're going to get. But I like how she does this article. So I'll give you the basics of, of where it starts with. So it does start understanding the lost wife, marriage restoration. Long story short, you have a great wife, nice, kind. All of a sudden she brings up to her husband a bunch of his sins from like 15 years ago, out of the blue doesn't isn't normally a person who holds a record of wrong against him but all of a sudden brings up this stuff from 15 years ago and in his opinion it's wildly distorted and inaccurate what she's saying so let's check it out so they get to talking with her and you can see here as we dug deep into her past we we're blessed by god to get to the heart of the issue his wife is a cup that was formed as a child with a crack in her foundation that cannot retain love no matter how much she tried to love her, others love her, even God. She's unable to retain it, which makes her go out of her way to earn love through her actions. So, I've said some, I don't know, maybe tough things about why I don't think feminism is good for women. Why I don't think it's good for marriages. Why it's incompatible with Christianity. This is a logical argument. This is based on, you know assessing what is feminism, what's the tenets that it holds, compare those to what Christianity is about, do they line up, and then kind of like just anecdotal evidence. How, how does it seem to go for people to get into that, right? But here we have something that has really not very much to do with logic or whatever is going on. There was something that happened to her in her past. Now, if you have people that grow up in a church culture who never received Christ, this is what I often think you've seen. If you never have people who have that real born again experience where they say, God loves me, he forgave me, he saw my guilt, I turned all that over to him, the Holy Spirit came into my life. This is a revolution for a person. For people that hang around the church, maybe raised in the church, and they haven't had that experience, this is where they end up in my opinion. They don't receive love from God or from other people, maybe from God most importantly, because they've never actually truly come to have a relationship with God for whatever reason. Maybe it was some trauma or whatever, whatever this crack in her foundation is. But what you end up with is really high performing religious types who get into ministry and do different types of things and 
they cannot receive love from their husbands or God and they're just like try to work like crazy so as we go on we learn in her childhood there was a father wound that formed a belief about herself that she is unworthy of being loved and for guys we've done the quest for authentic manhood by Robert Lewis and so you can check him out these are groups men's groups um, that look at this heart wound that many of us can receive men and women we both receive it differently and it works its way out in destructive ways differently but what it says in this woman's life that made her work extra hard to keep her cup full but she feels defeated as her cup always runs quickly out nothing she does is good enough to keep feeling good about herself she would not blame the person for making her feel that way she would just try harder as it was her fault so if you've ever been in a relationship with someone like this it's difficult i mean if they kind of the pseudo what pop psychology would say oh you're dealing with a person with a low self-esteem but it's like worse than that you know i mean um when we're operating out of these things before we have god come and speak and attend to these things when we come to deal with our father or our mother and realize the imperfect love that we got from them their flaws their incorrect things that they taught us when they let us down or they sinned against us whatever until we kind of really take some time and it it often takes something like fairly significant to go back and look at that which is why i think that that robert lewis group is so good when i first did it a bunch of years back i was like this is awesome this is really really good something that i would never seen before so check that out if you're a fellow and then ladies if there's something similar for y'all where it looks at how to become an authentic woman some kind of group bible study that's run by churches similar to what robert lewis has been doing in his organization then let us know anyways everything's always her fault she can't get it right she can't get the love cup filled up you know no matter what we do as husbands or what the lord does or anyone else so they go on as we prayed god showed me a backpack full of bricks every time she came into contact with any form of rejection and forgave the person she put a brick you are not worthy into her backpack so this can also be very difficult if you're running into people maybe at work even or other places in life where it's like very difficult to have any sense of accountability with them to hold them to certain standards standards to you know basically confront them and say hey you know even if you use i feel statements when you did this i felt this right or i felt this when you did that no matter how you word it or whatever happens it always seems to kind of like backfire you know it always seems like they feel that they are worse than before and so if you ever have a problem with this type of person it usually doesn't seem to go well by bringing it up verbally anyways she always accounted it against herself so going on she doesn't see that it was a lie a stronghold of wrong beliefs that did this to her she came to form another lie and rebel against it the lie which is this quote her husband is the one who made her feel this way about herself and destroyed her so sometimes it's just so nuts what i hear from these people's stories when divorce comes into play into the conversation and usually even way 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 before that where it's like any rational discussion of this is what was said what did you hear or um, this is what I said what did you think I said uh, here's what I did how did you interpret that like when I hear people and it's just like all of that is a total disconnect it just doesn't matter <laughs> you know it and it just evolves because then people feel like that they are they get defensive you know that they are not assessing the situation correctly because they have no other choice they are assessing what's said and what's meant and what's done improperly because they are you know they are interpreting it through their injury their father or mother wounds and so they're not ready to deal with that yet so they have to make some some other alternative sense of what's going on so anyways that backpack of bricks got too heavy for her to carry it weighed her down so much that she totally snapped and became angry at the reminder that she's not worthy she came to a place where she was not going to accept that lie any longer and fought back you may have seen your wife's 
uh, start to suffer in a way that appears as depression. Or she may have been trying to ease the weight of her burden through some type of healing. You may have noticed a slight change in her as the weight of the, p of the pain was becoming so heavy that it was no longer something she could handle. Not knowing how to do it anymore, she took that bag of bricks and decided to rebel against the pain and shame by sharing the blame or deflecting it totally on to you, using it to bash anyone that ever made her feel so unworthy. Her husband is the one right now getting the full force of her anger and pain. So gentlemen, if you are trying to do your best, you do have some of your own sins, but it's like everything is just coming right on you and you're fairly convinced that it's mm, like unauthorized or uh, unjustified, then think, I mean, trust your gut intuition, trust that the Holy Spirit is in you and say, I don't think this is really my all my faults. I don't think that her anger and upset should really, uh, is rightly explained because of things I've done or said or failed or failed to meet up to certain expectations. There's got to be more to it than that. If that's your sense, I think you should trust yourself, okay? And, which is why I'm, I'm talking about this, and then, you know, there's more that we can get to, but her husband is the one getting the full force of her anger and pain. Out of that bag is every account she had previously forgiven and let go. As she throws those bricks at him, he can see her version of the quote-unquote truth and how she took it. Many of them are nothing close to how it really happened or how he intended it. But that is exactly how unworthy and rejection roots operates. So if your wife hasn't talked to you, if she won't have sex with you, if uh, whatever's going on, if you, you know, it could turn out all kinds of different ways. They talked about depression, they talked about whatever, right? Anger, a lot of anger, a lot of blaming. This is really helpful. So they shield the person from the real truth. They twist and contort the truth before it ever gets to the person so that what they hear, see, feel is not even close to reality. All because rejection and unworthiness roots operate from a deceit place where you can never satisfy them. So it doesn't matter how much more romantic you are or thoughtful or try to change gentlemen. It's not your issue. It's not your problem. I'm not going to read all that, but it's all your fault is the lie. The truth is the broken place in their foundation is to blame. And the fact that it never was healed with the help of God. And no matter who they find, where they go, meaning if they take a new relationship or if they find a new job or a new career or, you know, leave you or whatever, start dating, whatever. What you want and why we pray for them is that they will be set free, that the chains will be broken, the bars will be cut, and they will be released from the evil. Remember the seeds that the enemy came and so sown in the night, right? In the parable of the wheat and the tares. It's this type of thing, right? And you need something to happen. It's a little bit loose analogy, but I think it's kind of in the same ballpark. This is something that your the enemy has done to your spouse early on before you ever met them, and you're trying to deal with the aftermath and sort out, you know, is this your fault? Are you a bad spouse? Now, this is really interesting. Why get God can't use you to heal your wife? So this whole entire time, your wife has been trying to get you to heal, fix, and help her broken foundation. Through her efforts to earn her worth, your love and approval, she has tried to heal her own soul. She has tried to find her worth and value, the two things that keep getting leaked out through the break, through people. And not through the proper place. God, only God, can be the one that heals, restores, repairs the damage done, and seals up the cracks in her foundation. If you do that, it will only reinforce that she doesn't need God. This is why we pray for people. We call them prodigals. They're off on this kind of nuts journey. And their life is going to continue to be kind of crazy until they get the healing from God. When they get the healing from God, this is what we're praying for more than anything. More than for restored marriages, right? 
we're trying to, to get as much good and insight from the pain, the motivation from the pain of what we've gone through to upgrade and get on our knees and say, God, actually, I suck at this. I'm not good at that. I'm, I'm lame at this. I, I toy around with these sins. I haven't been 100% honest about these areas, right? This is what we're trying to do with our time, right? And then what we're praying that will happen with them is that they will get the healing that they so desperately need for these things. This is what we mean when we pray for their salvation. We pray that they would, you know, come back home, repent. I mean, this is what it means to repent, just to be honest with God and say, God, there, I have this thing with my mom or my dad or whatever happened, you know. People call me. They say, oh, I was being molested by my grandfather. Oh, I was anorexic. I was suicidal. I was bulimic, right? I mean, I hear these stories, you know, it's it's amazing to me as people find out the channel that I'm doing and then people want to tell their story. People want to say, wow, this is amazing. I, I'm looking for other honest people in, in life. Here's my story. Let me tell you what God has done for me. And when he sets people free, they're able to talk about it. They're not ashamed anymore. They're able to say, I know what happened, what I survived through, and the God's my savior. He came to rescue me thank God he did, right? Because I was in such a mess. I needed him so desperately and I still need him so desperately. Thank God he never, never gives up on me, you know? And so this is what we're praying, you know? When we're praying, uh, we don't want to see people go to hell. We don't want to see them get stuck in further, further levels of sin by, you know, kind of painting over this with a second marriage. This is why it's not just the cold, hard uh, theology of the thing. We see that if the theology that we're talking about doesn't come to take, you know, doesn't come to pass in their life, it's going to be bad. We don't want it to be bad for them. We love them, you know, we love them. We want to see them on the victory parade. So that's why maybe it's good. If you're wondering, God, why is this taking so long? Well, I mean, however long it takes, right? You want to see your spouse come to terms with whatever they're dealing with, whatever the heck happened. And if you're not a, a good person to be in the picture for the time being, then I mean, at least that gives you some relief, right? I mean, you can live with that, can't you? If in the long view, God is going to work out things that he couldn't never do through you, right? I mean, I don't want to be like a, a, a demigod, right? I don't want to be a mini savior. I don't want to be the mini Holy Spirit. I want to be a, a husband, a godly husband in my wife's life that demonstrates leadership roles and can hear from the Holy Spirit and has a plan and can make some decisions. But I don't want to be responsible for trying to fix all of that stuff that I don't even know about. It's a great article. It's a great article. You know, and I'll, I'll let you finish the rest of it. I'll leave you the link. But I just thought it was really, really nice compliment to the theology because it addresses the emotional side of life where people get real hung up, real stuck, where they don't know what to do with the disappointment, their feelings, and the lies that they believe. Unworthiness, guilt, didn't do enough. It aren't loved, you know, always fail, um, you know, these types of things. And they come out. They come out eventually. So I just thought, wow, great, great, great. Uh, this is her, Sheila Hollinger. You can donate to them. And they, of course, they have a blog. And you can find them on YouTube. Okay? Well, thanks so much, you guys. Really appreciate you. We'll see you on the next one. Keep overcoming evil with good. Yeah, and we'll see you soon.